said that was too loud. I want a trio and I want one now. Yeah, well, we all do, man, but listen. Not one, not two, I mean... but three things in it. Well, hello again, everybody. And as you can see, I've got the Trio Model 9R 59DS on the bench today. Now, I think some of you might have seen this radio before because it was actually featured in one of my previous videos where this thing was uh, actually lurking in my loft. There we go, we've entered a dark and spooky place where old radios come to die. Everybody has one of these. If you don't believe me, go up to your loft, go to the back of it. Everybody has one of these Trio 9Rs lurking somewhere. You go upstairs, look under the bed, there will be one. Go back to the back of the shed, there's probably two or three in there. Um, they certainly are a very ubiquitous receiver. They are everywhere. So speaking from memory, this Model 9R has probably sat in the loft unused for about 10 years. And I seem to think even when I bought it, I didn't pay very much money for it. I think I paid about 10 it might have been 10 or 20 pounds, it was, it was very little. But basically I didn't even bother plugging it in at the time because I have far better radios. But the reason I bought it is because, um, incredibly, the Model 9R is the first piece of radio equipment which I ever played with because my grandfather used to have one. So the reason I bought it, I bought it for nostalgia reasons. Didn't get a chance to plug it in at the time, put it in the loft and uh, yes, that's where it sat for... Well, I say 10 years, it's probably more likely 20 years it's been set up there. But it's never been used. So my plan was, I was just going to pull the radio out of storage. I've got to admit, valve equipment is relative reliable. Uh, this is of an age, I think probably around the early 1970s. So it doesn't have any waxy capacitors in it. So although it probably will need some work doing on it, I actually expected just to plug it in and for it to work. Well, unfortunately I did plug it in and it, it didn't work properly. Let me just show you what the problem is and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay well it looks like the first problem is operator error because we need to plug it in. Okay so let's just switch on and let it warm up. Now these uh, 9R receivers they were actually very very popular. I think I've often joked in the past that everybody owns a 9R somewhere. You know you go to the back of your uh, go to the back of the loft or have a look under the stairs and you're bound to find one of these 9R receivers. Uh, they were made in quite high volumes and the reason they were so attractive isn't because they were great performers. They, they weren't great performers. Um, the, the response of these receivers is it's probably average at best. But what made them really so popular is the fact that they were relatively cheap by standards of the day. They were actually affordable. Now they weren't cheap but they were at least affordable for many people. So really, back in the day, it was probably the choice between something like a, a 9R or maybe some still some uh, war surplus equipment that was probably kicking about. So that was your choice, and of course a lot of people chose to go down the Japanese route and buy the, uh, the Trio 9R model. Now the other great thing about the, uh, the 9R, I'd actually say it's almost the perfect trainer. In, you know, in terms of a communication receiver, it's got all the parts that we need. It's very, very well laid out and it's easy to work on. So that makes it very attractive. Now, the other thing about it, if you actually read the manual for the 9R, it's almost designed to be modified by the operator. They did things like leave um, valve bases in there. They put valve bases in, but no valves. And, uh, they put switches in there, but didn't connect them. And if you actually read the instructions for the 9R, it actually lists a lot of modifications that you can carry out and uh, improve the uh, radio yourself. So I'm guessing that they really managed to clue into the mentality of the day where people didn't still just want to buy a receiver, they still wanted to do something practical. You know, we weren't quite in the days of black box radios where you just go to the local ham shop, you buy a plastic box and you switch it on and there's, there's your HF station. You know, the people who bought the 9R still were experimenters and they still wanted to do some of their own modifications. Okay, so let's see what we can hear. I've just got an aerial plugged in. Have we got an aerial plugged in? No, let's plug an aerial in. That'll be a good start, won't it? Well, as you can hear, the radio has just sprung into life there. I've actually just got a, a random length of wire plugged into the back of it, so it isn't tuned or anything like that. Um, it's actually showing a signal strength 9 on the meter here. 
Uh, don't get excited by that. You can make the signal strength meter show anything you want. There's an adjustment pot on the back, but it's uh, yeah, it's showing nine, so we're getting a good signal. So at the moment, I'm set to band A, band A which is between 550 uh, kilohertz and 1.6 megahertz. So that appears to be working fine. Let's just tune across the band so you can have a listen. Oh, was that a damn skiff, something like that? Oh, that's a boring piece of music, isn't it? Okay, let's switch on to band B, which is 1.6 to 4.8 megahertz. Well, not a lot happening uh, on band B, but I think it is working. But, uh, let me go on to uh, band C now. So band C is between 4.8 megahertz and 14.5. Now, I don't know if you heard that, the receiver on band C has actually effectively gone silent. We're not getting any crackling at all. So let me go back to band B for comparison. Band C. So we've got a problem with, uh, with band C. In fact, oh, maybe it worked there. Did it spring into life? What I would say, that's still relatively quiet. Now, I want to be a little bit more scientific in what we're doing, so I think the best thing to do is, rather than just uh, tuning round, I think the thing to do is we need to get a signal generator out. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and keep the signal generator set to the same level. And I'm just going to choose an input of something like 2 microvolts, now, for any type of uh, communication receiver, in fact, most radios, most radios should uh, pick up a signal of um, 2 microvolts. I'm also not going to get too sniffy about how we connect that, because some people will say, well, is that PD or is that EMF or are you connecting into a 75 ohm load or... Oh, no, we're just going to connect up the signal generator. We're going to feed a signal in from a 50 ohm output into a 75 ohm receiver and uh, 2 microvolts will make it do something. So let's do that. So to start with we're going to set our carrier frequency to 1 megahertz. We're going to go to AM modulation. I'm going to choose 30% because um, that's typically what I use. And for an input level I'm just going to go for 2 microvolts. So I'm just taking the output lead from my signal generator and via an adapter to a, a PL259 I'm just sticking that into the, uh, the radio connector at the back, the antenna connection. So let me screw that in. So in theory we should both do uh, hear something now. Let me turn the volume up a little bit. In fact I'll turn it down because it was fully up, don't want to blow my ears off. Well, it's pretty faint, but I'm hoping you can hear that. Well, I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear that, so I've just picked up the speaker for you. Well, I've got to admit, for a 2 microvolt input level, I would have expected to hear something a little bit louder than that. So that's maybe an indicator that this radio does require some alignment, but I can hear something. So at the end of the day, 2 microvolts is a relatively low level signal. You know, a good communication receiver, I would expect this to be louder even 1 microvolt. So 2 microvolts is not, is, not, is not perfect. Now I have got the RF gain. It's important you need to have the RF gain turned right up. And we also need to make sure we've got the AF gain turned up, which we have. So let's go do the same thing now for band B. 
So without wanting to move the dial too much, I'm just going to move it over to the uh, the three megahertz uh, tuning and go on to uh, band B here. So let's reset the signal generator again and see if we can hear a tone. Carrier three megahertz. Well okay, sorry about that everybody, it appears that I actually made a little bit of a mistake there in that I was trying to tune in on the main tuning dial here and I tuned in to, uh, to 3 megahertz, and I couldn't actually hear anything. Now what I was actually getting is I was actually picking the signal up down here when I was actually hunted round. So the problem that I actually had was that unfortunately this has got a band spread on it and I had the band spread set wrong so it actually was throwing the main tuning dial out. So I've gone ahead and I've uh, I've just set the uh, the band spread to the capacitor to be fully open now and uh, of course this is actually realigned and it is bang on, bang on the 3 megahertz mark now. So uh, we can now hear the tone and uh, again it's receiving this at 2 microvolts so that's okay. OK, let's test band C now, which is our problem one. So this one tunes between 4.8 and 14.5. So I'm just going to set that to, again, about centre of the dial here, which is, uh, I think that's round about 9 megahertz. Carrier, 9 megahertz. Just hunting round in case it's just slightly out of calibration, the dial. But no, we're not, we're not getting anything. Let me try increasing the signal level. So let's put a really big signal in. RF level 100 microvolts. So that's a massive signal we're putting into the radio antenna connector now. So, not a sausage. This needle on here should be banging over and bending now if this was working properly. But we're not, we're not getting anything. So, yes, as we suspected, band C. Well, band C isn't just a little bit deaf. It's totally non-functional. And this, to me, there's quite a clue there. Um, there's certain things which will totally shut a radio down. I mean, we can clearly see this radio is working on band A and band B. And uh, it's actually also working on band D. So that pretty means that... Um, in terms of the actual IF stage, the IF stage is certainly capable of working because the IF stage is working for bands A, B and D. Um, the audio amplifier is working because, again, we can hear audio on bands A, B and D. So it's a problem which is going to be something specific to band C. So you're kind of thinking now, what could that be? So the areas that I'm thinking of it's either um, the front end of the receiver, so it's actually the uh, the tuning part, the, the aerial tuning and the pre-selection and stuff like that. So it's either something to do with the front end, it's not the RF amplifier, or it's unlikely to be the RF amplifier, because again the RF amplifier is working on bands A and B and D. So what else could shut it down? Well, I'm actually thinking the fact it is just so dead and it goes so quiet. At the top of my list at the moment is local oscillator. That's what I think the problem is. I think that we'll find if we do a little bit more testing that the local oscillator isn't running on band C. Uh, before we do that, let's just check band D as well. OK, so I've turned the radio around to give myself a little bit of better access. Now, I'm not particularly familiar with this radio, and I don't do a lot of radio repairs, so I need to make a lot of notes and things. So you can see that I've gone ahead, and with an indelible marker, I've just written on what all the valve numbers are, and also some of the main components. So I've got here that this is the uh, this is a local oscillator valve, this is the mixer. Uh, I think, which one is that? I think that's a... Uh, what did I write that down? I don't know if that's an RF amplifier. Yeah, maybe it's an RF amplifier, I can't quite remember. Uh, there's the detector, there's our BFO because it's a communication receiver so it can uh, it can resolve uh, it can resolve SSB and we've also got our power amplifier valve here. So I'm kind of thinking that the problem is something to do with our local oscillator. The way that one of these radios works is um, it has a local oscillator valve which is this one and it takes the the incoming RF coming in from the antenna socket and we've got a mixing valve here so it mixes the incoming signal from the antenna it mixes it in this valve with the local oscillator and that produces our IF now the IF frequency for this radio it's 455 kilohertz so the local oscillator valve here which is that one this runs 455 
kilohertz above the incoming uh, signal frequency that we're tuned to. So you should be able to listen to this. So if I set the radio to 1 megahertz, for example, we should be able to monitor the oscillator valve here. The oscillator valve should then be running at 1.455 megahertz. Now of course there's many ways we can see if our local oscillator valve is working and uh, well, one of the probably the best ways is actually just to use another radio receiver, get another radio out when you can probably listen to it. So we have a, if we had another radio and we tuned it into uh, 1.455 megahertz, we should be able to actually hear the local oscillator running. We should be able to hear that. Now, of course, there's lots of ways we can try to determine if our local oscillator is running. The operating manual for this uh, receiver says that we can actually introduce a, a current meter into the local oscillator circuit and uh, it gives current readings that, that will tell you whether or not it's oscillating. Uh, another popular way of doing it, which I think is better because it's non-intrusive, we can just use another radio receiver. So if we had another radio receiver to hand we could tune that to uh, 1.455 megahertz and we could listen again for the local oscillator. Now, I don't happen to have a, another radio receiver readily to hand, but the other reason is I'm basically very, very lazy, and to go and find another radio receiver would require some effort on my part, and uh, that's generally to be avoided. So I'm going to use what's on the bench in front of me, which is uh, I'm going to use a spectrum analyzer to look for the local oscillator, and I actually think it's quite nice, and you might find that quite interesting to see a local oscillator, so let's do that. Well, unfortunately, it looks like you're going to be denied of any Marconi Spectrum Analyzer action today because, uh, as usual, it's died again. There seems to be something wrong with the, uh, the front end this time in that the higher frequencies are working, but the lower frequency ranges are uh, it's putting a lot of attenuation in. So uh, something wrong with the input filter responses somewhere. Well, I have threatened it and, uh, you know, if it doesn't behave itself, it's going to have to go to Simon Spears, I'm afraid. So I actually think the basic problem is that this old uh, spectrum analyzer now is getting on probably for 40 years old or more and uh, everything is kind of in its wear out period, wear out phase now. And uh, of course we could go through it and change out all the tantrums and you know all the rest of it but it gets to the point where this is a very complicated piece of equipment and um, You've got to look at the cost of trying to keep it alive. At one time, spectrum analyzers, probably like this, probably cost 50,000, maybe 100,000 pounds. But you can buy a really very good spectrum analyzer now uh, for, you know, little more than a thousand. Uh, probably wouldn't be as good as this one, but yeah, you can buy them. So, you know, it just becomes an increasing amount of work to keep these old things going. It's a bit like owning vintage cars. You can keep them going, but you know, you spend more time trying to keep them going than you do actually driving the things. And that, that's what this thing has become, a bit of a millstone. Anyway, we will repair it, but that will be in another video. And even the individual sections are really heavy. Oh. Ah. Okay, bye-bye Marcone. Oh, look at all that lovely space we've freed up. Quick, we'd better fill it with something. Well, I guess this is a good opportunity to give everything a little bit of a clean because I have got maybe several <laughs> several generations of uh, dust bunnies living behind here. Uh, yeah, it's been about 12 months since I've had to lift out the way that Marconi Spectrum Analyzer. So, good opportunity to get rid of some of this dust and dirt and filth. What a mess. Well, I've got to admit, I'm actually quite disappointed with the old Marconi. It didn't even have the decency to explode properly, did it? Well, it's only a moment for you, but for me it's actually quite a few days later. And as you can probably see, the end of my workbench here is looking a little bit different because the old Marconi Spectrum Analyzer, I'm afraid it's gone. I've got to admit, unfortunately, I've just been having more and more problems with that Marconi Spectrum Analyzer. And every time it's gone wrong in the past, and it has done numerous times, I've managed to repair it. 
but it's starting to get to the point now where it's spending more time being repaired than it is when I'm actually using it because the relatives it's just old and it's unfortunately it's pretty worn out and although we could go around replacing every capacitor in the thing it's kind of getting to the point where it's just really not economic but I am going to have a go at repairing it the reason that I'm not doing it here is simply because I don't have the bench space so as you can see I've actually moved the old Marconi out of the way and that's actually created some new space so I've got at the moment I've got the Rigol spectrum analyzer set up which uh, well I've got to admit it's a bit of a poor comparison to the Marconi but it's quite usable and I've got my oscilloscope now set a bit lower down on the right now I'm afraid it's taken a little bit of getting used to because my muscle memory is used to the Marconi being there but we're getting used to it and I've got to admit this new layout is probably more practical I think I probably kept that old Marconi going far longer than I should have done because uh, well because I do like it and nostalgia reasons but the reality is I can reach the controls on the uh, scope and on the Rigel and in fact on the Stabilock that it's sat on I can actually reach everything much more comfortably now so I think I've actually maybe improved things now in the middle of your screen you're also going to be able to see another upgrade to my bench so you can see on the left there I've got my isolated output and that's uh, feeding 230 volts from my isolation transformer that I've got under the bench on the right hand side you can see we've got some output terminals so they go to my uh, lab power supplies that are on the shelf above but you can see in the middle there I've actually installed a brand new wall box and that's got a PL259 connector on it and two speaker outlets so the PL259 that's actually just going via a length of coax to a long wire I've got running down the garden so that's going to be handy for doing reception tests because before I was just having to throw bits of wire up and I was picking up a great deal of noise in this room so that should be a little bit better and then underneath the PL259 we've got two speaker outlets so behind me I've got two Wolfdale speakers which I can now use as monitors now I've not got them plugged in at the moment but we may use them again in the future now I'm hoping that this new PL259 connector is going to make it much easier to feed in some uh, signals into receivers that are being tested on the bench so let's just give that a try now on the trio Well I've got to admit because it was a few days ago when I started this video I'm not sure if I actually explained about this being a super hat and actually also the IF frequency that this uses. So this is a super hat radio and the intermediate frequency that this uses is 455 kilohertz. So once you actually know what the intermediate frequency is um, that will actually tell you what the local oscillator should be running at because basically the local oscillator should be running at the IF frequency above whatever you're tuned to. So at the moment I'm actually tuned to a, a signal of 1 megahertz and we add to that our intermediate frequency which is 455 kilohertz. We get 1.455 megahertz. So you can see hopefully on the display here the, the marker is saying that it's actually set to about 1.45 well 1.46 now well that's actually pretty good this radio is actually pretty spot on frequency you're never going to get it exactly you're always going to get these things drifting up and down a little bit so I'm hoping you can see that I've just adjusted the main tuning to 1.5 megahertz so again you should be able to calculate now pretty easily in your head what do you expect our local oscillator to be running at so if we set our main tuning dial to 1.5 megahertz and our IF frequency is 0 0.455 megahertz we've just got to add the two numbers together now I'm just going to add it lazily in my head and say that say that it's about 2 megahertz isn't it so uh, 455 kilohertz plus 1.5 megahertz that equals about 2 megahertz just add the numbers together and uh, you can see now that the uh, the marker on the spectrum analyzer again it's saying 2 megahertz it's not exactly bang on I think it's 2.001 it's flicking around a little bit but it's damn close to 2 megahertz so in our trio receiver here is our oscillator and this is a little loop antenna which I've just got wrapped around the shield can and I'm picking up just enough of the uh, signal here to display that on the spectrum analyzer so here's our local oscillator so we've just shown that that's running at 2 megahertz and here's our mixer valve so this is a mixer valve here and it's uh, ooh, it's quite hot 
because it's a valve, of course it's hot. So those two signals, the 2 megahertz from the local oscillator, that's actually being mixed with the incoming signal at 1.5 megahertz. And what you get is what they call sum and difference frequencies. So just to keep the maths easy, I'm just going to say that if we actually take away 1.5 megahertz from 2 megahertz, which is what the local oscillator is running at, we get the difference of 500 kilohertz. Well, the IF strip for this radio, it's tuned to 455, but let's just round it up to 500. So you can see that what's actually happened, uh, the incoming radio frequency at 1.5 megahertz, that's been downshifted. It's been downshifted to 455 kilohertz. So if I take our main tuning control, and I'm just actually reducing the frequency now, so I'm tuning down the band. I just reduce that what you should hopefully see is you're also going to see the local oscillator that's also going to fall in frequency well I think it's time for an impromptu pop quiz so right now you can see that we've actually got the local oscillator set to 1.25 megahertz so basically you've got all the information you need now to tell me what we've actually got the tuning dial set to so come on what do you think it's set to you should be able to work it out So I'm hoping you can see that just up from the bottom scale, our radio on the main tuning control is now set to 0.8 megahertz. Well, I'm sure, of course, a lot of you people who are still watching me at home are thinking, well, that's all well and good, but unfortunately I don't have a spectrum analyzer. What can I do? Well, of course, for many years, I didn't have a spectrum analyzer either. So what we actually used to do, and this is what everybody used to do, they used to just take another radio. And what you can do is you can listen to the radio that you're working on. You can listen for the local oscillator. So I'm going to actually exploit a little technique here called FM quietening. I mean, I've explained this in a previous video. So basically, if we set the radio to FM, it will go quiet when it's tuned to the same frequency as your local oscillator. So let me turn this on, it's going to be a bit noisy. So it's noisy gone quiet, it's got noisy again. So now I've got this radio in my hand it should be quite easy to see if this local oscillator is running on band C. So first of all to keep the maths easy I'm going to set it to an easy frequency. So on here I'm going to set it to 5 megahertz. So that's 5 megahertz. So our local oscillator should be running at 455 kilohertz above that. So that should be 5.455 megahertz. I'm going to turn the sound up. And in theory, we should be able to hear the local oscillator running when it goes quiet. And I'm not picking anything up, the radio isn't going silent. So that's proving that after all that, yes, the local oscillator isn't running. I can just do the same thing on the spectrum analyzer. Now, before our local oscillator was running at quite a low frequency, it was only running about 1.45 megahertz. But now, because we're on a higher band, our local oscillator is going to be higher as well. So I've just got to go ahead and I've got to reset the Rigel. So I need to make the center frequency here. I need to make that. 5.455 megahertz so let me go ahead and do that so press frequency and uh, frequency and that will be 5.455 megahertz so, so now the center of our display here that should be showing me a local oscillator and uh, well, there's nothing there, so our local oscillator isn't running. Now, when I actually started playing with this Trio 9R, I actually said it was totally dead on band C. But as it turns out, I was actually wrong. I made a mistake there. It isn't dead, but it is actually dead at the, um, at the lower part of the frequency range. So you can't, obviously, you can't hear anything at the moment. Let me just turn the volume and the gain fully up. You can't hear a, a whistle, not a dicky bird. And uh, we've explained that. The reason you can't hear anything is because the local oscillator isn't running. 
but it does actually reach a point where if we just keep increasing the frequency on band C you might just hear a little pop coming from the speaker and we start to get noise because the local oscillator does actually seem to fire into life so let me just make the adjustment so we're at 7 megahertz still nothing 8 megahertz still nothing and about 9.8 megahertz it just springs into life Now when it's actually working on Bansi, it's actually quite lively. So for some reason it looks like our local oscillator, it's starting and stopping. It works at the higher end of the frequency band, but it doesn't work at the lower end. And again, with the aid of the spectrum analyzer, we can actually see what's happening with the local oscillator. So let me, uh, let me show you that. So I think what I'll do is I'm just going to tune the radio to the high frequency where it's actually working. Well, as you can probably see from the marker that I've got set on the spectrum analyzer, this radio receiver is tuned to about 14 megahertz at the moment. Now you can see that the local oscillator is jumping around a little bit, and uh, these radios really were known for drifting around quite badly. This radio has been switched on for about 20 minutes, but really I'd expect it to take an hour or two before it actually stops drifting around, and then it will uh, it will still drift somewhat. These radios, again, they were famous for having to chase a signal across the tuning band. And of course that makes it even more difficult to try to resolve any SSB signals. But the main problem with this receiver, you're actually going to see it as I start to reduce the tuning frequency. So let me just, uh, I'm just going to start to reduce the frequency. And you're going to see the, uh, the marker generator, it should follow us. But the biggest problem you're going to see is the local oscillator, it's going to start to fall. It's going to start to get smaller and smaller as I reduce the frequency. So the radio's tuned to uh, probably just over 10 megahertz at the moment. You can see the local oscillator has dropped by quite a bit. Let's keep going. Oh, and it's gone completely. I think we got to about 9 megahertz there, and then the local oscillator, it just disappeared. So let's increase the frequency, and hopefully it should, it should reappear like a submarine popping out of the ocean. Oh, there it is. So I'm just going to increase our frequency back to 14 megs. And just for completeness, let's uh, reduce the frequency again and watch our local oscillator submerge. Should disappear any moment now. There it goes. And of course now the local oscillator has completely disappeared. If I keep reducing the frequency on the dial, uh, you could hear the radio tuning before and now you can't hear it tuning because the radio won't work if the local oscillator isn't functioning. So I guess all we've got to do now is find out why our local oscillator isn't functioning. Trio. Too loud. Trio. I said that was too I loud. I want a trio and I want one now. Yeah, well we all do man, but listen. Not one, not two, I mean, but three things in I a